and now I would uh, like to welcome uh, Geraldine Bunche from uh, Scotland and uh, Catherine Gotteridge from Birmingham. Uh, and you can take over from here and transcend yourself. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce a project um, that Geraldine and myself have been working on. This presentation is called Maternity Care for Women Who Survive Sexual Abuse, Healing Harm, and Helping Healing and Avoiding Harm. This is an area of interest I've personally been working on now for more than 15 years and follows on from work that I started many, many years ago, early in my midwifery career, that has gathered a great deal of interest and support, uh, particularly latterly for midwifery, but also the wider maternity agenda. I think one of the first things to establish in this uh, presentation is the prevalence of this group of women that we're talking about. Adult sexual abuse particularly um, is an issue that affects women and from a national and international perspective one could say that approximately one in four women are affected by issues around sexual abuse, particularly childhood sexual abuse. Many women never disclose their experiences of abuse, however it's not unusual for those women when they become pregnant and when they're giving birth to their babies to make some manner of disclosure and it's really a difficult scenario then for the woman but also for those maternity staff who are trying to provide the best of care. So you could ask the question, uh, what's the impact on childbearing women and what has this lifelong issue to do with uh, maternity services? Well, we care for women across a range of times in their pregnancy and we could we could come into contact particularly with women early in their pregnancy who are afraid to use the service and at risk at any time really from vicarious harm. Research particularly in um, the Swedish and Danish uh, research areas have looked at this problem and have found that this group of women are more than likely to uh, succumb to harm such as post-traumatic stress disorder, um, birth trauma, ongoing mental health problems and dissatisfaction particularly with their birth experience. It's a very in intimate and intuitive time for women um, becoming pregnant and also giving birth. When you look at the type of care that midwives are, what are wishing to deliver, um, the implication for harm is much more increased the more intimate the clinical procedure is. Now one has to ask the question, is this procedure particularly necessary? and is this procedure necessary at this time and how can I best deliver this intervention um, with the woman consenting to it. I think another interesting um, and particularly useful issue is around how women present in maternity services. They may well delay presenting to us and that could be for a number of reasons. One could be that they're afraid that we may make judgments on uh, their disclosures and one may be that they're afraid of how they might behave and be uh, subjected to clinical interventions without their consent. 
So it's really important that women have confidence in us to um, allow their care to be given in a way that minimizes or avoids their distress. So what are the late implica uh, implications for those women booking late or presenting late in their pregnancy and birth? Well, if you think about the issue of booking late, well, these women will by nature be denied of the full range of screening opportunities that we like to offer to women. and. If nothing else, establishing that relationship that we we so value for these women. If women are avoiding our service altogether, then they're being denied a very, very useful resource, which is building up um, a body of knowledge for how she will cope with her pregnancy and how she can plan to be the parent that she desires. She could refuse those interventions and refuse screening, and, and that's absolutely fine. It, it's really up to her to choose. But what is not acceptable is that if we don't make every effort to engage with these women, then we will, by that very nature, be, um, be allowing that woman to decline interventions without the full knowledge of their benefits. She may uh, continue to choose birth care based on fear rather than education. Now, all women uh, have an element of anxiety, um, which is normal during pregnancy, but I would suggest that this group of women are much more fearful and much more um, likely to ex experience increasing levels of fear during pregnancy. Now, that could then move into the domain where these women choose a method of birth based upon that fear. This might be um, a birth at home without a medical or a midwifery attendant. It may be to request even for a cesarean section when she's never had um, a cesarean section or at least a, a baby before. So fear-based decisions are increasingly um, common in this group of women. I've mentioned that there is an increased anxiety during pregnancy and I think it's important to discern between pregnancy worry, pregnancy anxiety and pregnancy fear and then phobia. And this is the nature of my um, doctorate research that I'm undertaking at the moment. And this is um, increasingly evident to me in my engagement with women that many have had a history of child sexual abuse. One of the other areas that has a huge implication for maternity services and also for psychiatry is the prevalence of mental illness and is much more increased in this group of women. In a study around about eight years ago now in the UK undertaken by um, Hollis, this was based on inpatient psychiatric female patients. They were screened and asked the question, have you at any point experienced unwanted sexual attention or childhood sexual abuse? And that study revealed that 75% of women in the inpatient population of psychiatry at that time had a positive disclosure of sexual abuse. So one could argue that um, in screening women, we are likely to find that there is a greater prevalence than we already suspect. Another element that has undergone um, some evidence of research is dysfunctional labor. It's not uncommon when you put fear and you put birth into the same domain that a behavior or a physiological response will 
um, the evidence. There is a, a strong correlation with uh, cervical dystocia at um, near to full dilatation. And it's not unusual for this group of women to be unable to succumb to the, the second stage of labor with ease. There is much more prevalence with these women to have um, a, a cessation of labor at that point and encounter um, interventions, again, such as um, assisted deliveries and second stage cesarean sections. And then if one looks towards parenting, there is a whole raft of issues that can um, arise. The main one that is evident in the first stages is around breastfeeding and in, in handling the baby. Many women uh, talk about their experiences of putting their babies to the breast and feeling um, sensations and experiences that are not comfortable and almost take them back to the point when they were being abused as a child. So health practitioners have a whole range of issues to consider for this group of women. So if you were looking uh, without knowing of a positive disclosure, you would need to have um, some background information in a number of areas. Behavioral signs of sexual abuse can be um, very subjective, and one could argue that these might be attached to a whole range of personality or behavioral disorders. However, if you were to group them together, these are just a few of those signs, symptoms, or, or potential um, alerts to previous sexual abuse. So a history of post-traumatic stress disorder, self-harming or self-injurious behaviors leading sometimes to suicide attempts. Certainly, if you have discussions with these women, they would talk about having um, the thought processes of wanting to be out of this world. You would also encounter discussions around dissociative identity disorders, or for those more familiar with the phrase, um, altered identity or fabricated identity. This is the human protective state that takes the individual into another person where they can behave as entirely different to the person that they are. Personality disorders, whether they're borderline or full range disorders, and psychosis are commoner, particularly in those children who were abused at an early age and where the abuse is multiple in form. For instance, such as um, in involving animal abuse, ritual abuse, and some of those uh, satanic or um, religious elements where the child has been subjected to brainwashing. These, these women will have um, a history of dependence on various substances, which could be um, alcohol and could be drug-related. The individuals can have a history of eating disorders and low self-esteem and low belief in themselves. The physical elements can be around signs of old trauma on the body. Um, she can have a long and enduring feeling of malaise. Very often, um, these women may have things um, associated with multiple uh, physical complaints without a diagnosis. There is no doubt that these women were having um, a much more common disease profiles, such as asthma, irritable bowel disease, migraine, and headaches. 
And then, of course, um, if you go into the gynecological spectrum, these women will disclose long-standing pelvic pain, endometriosis, repeated sexually transmitted diseases, vaginismus, and vulval trauma. And, and these are just a few of some of those physical and disease profiles that uh, sexual abuse um, is likely to cause. So I would like now to, um, to, to just bring this into a more international and global context that sexual abuse is not just about um, one element, it's around um, a gender-based violence context. And that's where, if we look at the United Nations um, definition, that violence is directed against a woman simply because she is a woman. And that violence can affect women disproportionately. It includes acts that inflict physical, mental, sexual harm or suffering, threats of such acts, coercion, and other deprivations of liberty. I um, would also like to raise at this point elements around children where children are subjected to female genital mutilation, where children are used in war-based situations and, and rape, and where women and children witness um, physical, sexual, and violent behavior in front of them, uh, usually where there are um, discord either in the family home or discord in the community where they're living. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Geraldine, He's going to talk through some of the issues that we've worked on together and we'll bring you into uh, the project that we're talking about today. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I suppose as a midwife, we don't know everything. Nobody knows everything, but sometimes we don't know what we don't know. I have certainly came across a few women in my career, which is 30 years long now in maternity services, one way and another, and wasn't really a, totally aware of how much of an impact uh, sexual abuse had, could have for women. Until one morning, I was assisting uh, of another midwife who was caring for someone who had just been taken down to labor ward. And as soon as we went into the room, we could see that she was in transition. We had been told at the report that there was something in a confidential envelope. We have an electronic system, which requires you, of course, to go into the computer to get the electronic envelope open. Um, but we didn't know what was there. So we went into the room, and obviously we're in transition. The last thing that you're going to be doing is go and keep out a computer and go into the computer archive. So we, we just got on with looking after the lady. So what's coming now is her story, which began a journey, uh, which we'll go into after that. So call a lady Morgan. Um, obviously, Morgan is not her name. She had poor continuity of antenatal care, partly because she had moved house in the middle of her pregnancy. Partly because of staff sickness absence, and um, we know that it's, it's nobody's fault these things do happen, but in Scotland we've now realised how crucial that, that can be, especially to people who are vulnerable, that they have good parenting to continuity, so we're really focusing in on that now. She actually did make a disclosure of it very late in her pregnancy, about two weeks before she went into labour. But the communication of what is actually going on is suboptimal, and by that I don't mean, you know, we don't need details or anything like that, we just need to know that there is something extra about this lady that we need to, to consider in this case. When we thought that the baby was coming, we found that more than just wouldn't open her legs, she was in a new position, 
But I like most women who are trying to birth, who just could not open their legs. And you make the suggestion, you know, that will help the baby come. And she, she just couldn't do that. We thought, what is holding this lady back? Why is she not working with us, for want a better word, to try and get a baby, baby born? Because she was clearly getting more distressed. And we thought, we, we must be near. How can we best help her? She started screaming. It's a scream that I have never heard before. And thankfully, I have never heard since. Um, blood couple and screaming, um, that brought to mind a trapped animal rather than a woman in labour. She began biting her partner. She didn't piss her baby out, as Catherine said, sometimes just the physical sensations that are coming at the time of birth are too overwhelming. Um, she just could not help to, to get the baby pushed out at all. She did, of course, manage in the next few minutes, it seemed like a long time, um, to birth her baby. But unlike most of even when mums have been quite upset in the immediate run up to birth, she was uncannily quiet. There was not a sound in the room. There was no smile, no welcoming baby, not all the things that you, you love about when, when there's a birth. And she said she was still in pain. So she'd gone from a screaming woman, very vocal, very physical, to very in herself, non-communicative. Myself, the midwife that was with her, we were very shell shocked. We didn't, we didn't know what to do. We felt that I wonder what we could have done to have made that birth better for her. We felt vexed, so we, I went out to Scotland wide and asked, is there anybody who got specific sexual abuse and um, peer guidance out there? There wasn't anything specific. There were loads of um, publications in relation to domestic violence, but nothing about maternity care and helping us care with women who uh, stuck up sexual abuse. I was lucky at the time to be in contact with Fiona Dag Bell, who was the lead midwife at Quality Improvement Scotland, that's now Healthcare Improvement Scotland, after the murder. And to give me a slot to talk about more than another lady before that, um, to talk about these case studies and to raise awareness and, and get discussion going to see is there something that was missed. Um, because possibly sometimes when you actually ask a question you discover there's loads of things going on out there and there wasn't. However, um, we agreed that we that did need to go down the path for national guidance and one of the midwives, I think it was one of the midwives who um, came to the North of Scotland, had said that they'd fairly recently had Catherine up to talk to them. So, Although I had read Catherine's article uh, some time before that, um, it hadn't actually popped into my head at that point in time. So, we got a small subgroup, uh, a working party uh, together at Healthcare and Susan Scotland. Um, we only had two or three meetings, we were all very focused, very impassioned about the topic and, and the realisation that something desperately needed to be done. Um, we were lucky we did a professional witness research, we didn't have to go through all that and we got summaries of that. And this is all posted on the healthcare improvement website if anybody's got an interest and wants to look a bit further. Um, we decided that there was so much out there that we could have, you know, a, a huge tome of guidance and nobody would ever read it. And that wasn't what was required. So we decided that we would condense that into one page, A4, what to do and what not to do when you're caring for someone who's been sexually abused. I know in this slide it's got a wee bit squished and it's probably very difficult to read, but you will see it if you go to the Healthcare Improvement uh, Scotland website, um, you will find all that list of do's and don'ts on there. It doesn't tell you that just the bones of the flesh that needs to go on that, but at least if you think about these things, you're more likely to be able to give individualised and sensitive care. In my own patch, which is there in the maternity unit, um, 
I um, started these workshops some 10 years ago now, and, and I really feel at the moment there's an energy and an appetite for listening to this material that hasn't been there before. However, as you probably know, Scotland, whilst embracing this as a challenge, is not necessarily the case in the other three countries of the British Isles. Um, I, although I have done workshops up and down the country, that has not taken off in quite the same way that it has in Scotland. Scotland has really coordinated its approach with a number of, of midwives who are training and willing to do a much more uh, broader piece of work in education than uh, just focusing on maternity. Um, if it's possible to do it in one country, I, I really cannot see why it's, it's impossible to do it elsewhere. And, and I feel that women and their babies actually deserve it. My argument is that there should be an undergraduate and a postgraduate training element around abuse and all the aspects of abuse and education for health practitioners. I've done training for GPs. I've done training for neonatologists and obstetricians. I've also done training for anaesthetists, but it's very, very sparse. And I would say that this is more about people who have an interest to invite me to do it rather than a coordinated approach. So you might ask, um, why am I interested? Why is this a passion of mine? Well, the passion is because I was one of those women. I disclose very openly in the workshops that I do that I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. And I'd like to read to you um, a few lines of a poem that I wrote many, many years ago. and. The title of that poem is called Woman of Dirt, and Woman of Dirt was the name that I held for myself. My spirit has flown, left me lonely in this shell, of a body empty and sad, walking through hell. The burden and torment has crushed me with pain, left me defeated and lost and crying with shame. He creeps up behind me, his eyes burn in my back, his smell is so nauseous, his fingernails black. He totters and shuffles inches from my side. When I bravely turn round, it's all in my mind. I cringe and I shudder, the memories still hurt, of the baby, the child, the woman of dirt. I think I, I'm really going to leave um, this subject here because what Geraldine and, have try, and I have tried to do is give you an overview um, of what essentially is a, a lifetime's work for me, but certainly a whole day workshop in terms of the education that we introduce and also um, for the work that we're doing um, in Scotland in raising this as a huge public health issue but as a maternity issue that matters so much to women and matters so much to the clinicians who need to have education around the skills that would be useful when encountering sexual abuse during maternity care. Thank you for listening to us this afternoon. Thank you very much to Geraldine and uh, Catherine for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, now uh, you, you can ask questions in, uh, in the chat box for uh, Geraldine and Catherine.
There is a question coming up to Catherine. What tools and advice would you give for a woman who knows that she has had a sexual abuse as a child but don't remember it? Can you answer that question, Catherine? Um, the, the question I'm going to ask, answer is, what tools and advice would you give for a woman who knows that she has had, a, had sexual abuse as a child but doesn't remember it? I work in a way that embraces universal precautions. Universal precautions means that I expect every woman to have a secret, every woman to have an element of um, abuse in her lifetime. And if you engage in this in a way that wishes to do no harm and ensures that you talk to the woman in a way that puts her in control at every opportunity, then it shouldn't matter if you know or if she doesn't know. But what you are doing is protecting her dignity and protecting her when she needs great advocacy um, and when she's really um, at her most vulnerable. I have got skills and I have got uh, lots of advice which is practical that I cover in the workshop and I would say that it's easier to do it and to see it than it is to talk about it but it, that it's a very simple um, list of do's and don'ts. I think also some of this data is sharing the information. Catherine and I both agree that it's very important that the information gets shared so that's not a problem at all. Um, the DVDs that we're talking about eventually will go into the Knowledge Network in Scotland um, and possibly even onto YouTube or, or that in the future. Um, the learning things, the, the learning toolkit that we're trying to, to work on now and develop um, we're not quite sure about how that will be, but definitely our philosophy is, is, you know, if we can make it free and we can get to everybody, then everybody should share it. I suppose the, the other thing is we talked about disclosure, and I think Catherine at a school workshop um, has a slide up that's there's around about 50% of women never ever disclose. Um, you can correct me if that's slightly wrong there, Catherine. Um, but we are also advocates for universal precautions, obviously. If a woman does um, share that information with you, you can have it more individualised to her needs. And that's the important thing, it's, it's about her needs. But just think to the women potentially who don't share the number of schemes that we've heard in the labour wards, which are maybe more related to uh, flashbacks to previous abuse, um, you know, that. I, I think I'd like to, um, to say as well that uh, healing is a process. It's not necessarily... Um, a one uh, moment event. It can have um, years and years of hard work where you may work with a therapist, you may work with a counsellor. It's sometimes though just one thing that can make a huge difference. And I've cared for women both as a midwife and as a psychotherapist where they agree that actually giving birth and having a good birth experience is one of the most healing events in their lifetime that takes them from feeling like a victim to feeling as if they're now as beyond surviving but thriving. So I think that's important that midwives understand this is a process of movement rather than just one uh, element of care or one event. We have had a lady, a story that Cassie tells, who 
um, experience uh, you know, and did the very best we could in, in uh, first delivery. Um, however, there were things that we could have thought better in, in line with the fact that she could be this sexual abuse. She recently has had another baby and panel is almost identical circumstances, or identical complications, needing identical care. Um, the difference this time, she had midwife, a midwife team who had been to Catherine's study day, or were working with people who had been to Catherine's study day, um, speaking to the consultant, the multidisciplinary team, because she did require this cesarean section. The first time, she was very self felt after if her mental health wasn't good, the blending with her baby wasn't good. Second time, she felt, yeah, there was bits of it, but she was still difficult. We can't tell the one, we can't take this away, we can only do what we can do. But she actually blended far, far better with her baby and even ended up breastfeeding that baby, so it was transformational for her. There was a comment from Shannon in the chat box about the... Can you comment on, on her comment? Or do you want to comment on it? Uh, I, I can see the comment which says, um, I also think we have a responsibility not to negate birth trauma because a woman has been sexually abused. The two can be very separate events. I think that's a really important point as birth and abuse are individual experiences. I think it's very common for us in maternity not to understand the psychology of birth and not to understand the psychology of life. And trauma is trauma. Um, trauma can manifest itself in many ways under many different guises. And I do think um, there is a vulnerability, though, around women who've been sexually abused that makes trauma more likely. However, I take that point as a very, very good argument that the two events can be very separate and not have a unified, um, a unified conclusion. Absolutely. And then you, you make a very good point there about, you know, would the survivors of abuse coming forward just now because it's been very much in the media only this week um, as well and bring the silence to um, help care for people who have been uh, sexually abused as children in their locality and they have other branches in Scotland. Um, they have noticed a very significant increase in the field. I'd also like to come in at this point because one of the things that I said earlier on is around advocacy and about allowing the woman and to choose what she wishes to undertake during her pregnancy and birth, but also what um, she, she needs an advocate um, throughout the whole experience. And I think... Uh, in my experience, I feel sometimes midwives get confused about their allegiances to women and they often take the, the stance of the trust or take the stance of her registration. What I feel is really important is when you are caring for a woman is to engage totally in the element of advocacy. If a woman feels safe with you, whether she's been abused or not, um, that means that you are in some ways doing the job in the best way that you can. If she is a survivor of abuse, then she will know that she is safe with this midwife. And having the confidence to advocate for a woman is one of the key elements, I think, of this program that we're talking about. Uh, Lena, as you said about, you know, that it may not be until about that, but certainly the case with Morgan. Um, she 
as if when she had transitioned that it all started to unravel. And I went to see her after the, the bus the next day, and we had a brief discussion about, you know, how was the care. She, she felt the care was really good, that the main way that we're left with, you know, what if we could have done better. And we said, you know, would the section have been easier? And she said, absolutely not, because I can do this stuff thing. And if I'd have had a section, when I could have had a normal bus, then my abusers would have won. So, you know, very, very powerful statements, a very powerful women. So we shouldn't assume, you know, that any pathway for women is cast and food is whatever the women need. You should try and help. I'm reading um, comments to uh, one from Karen Law. Uh, what about octogenarians who've been abused as children and still not dealt with it? Um, in, in my other life as a psychotherapist, um, I've met probably one of the most saddest um, discussions I had was with an elderly woman who had been abused as a five-year-old child. and told me, uh, she was aged 83, told me for the very first time um, of that abuse. I think it was one of the most moving moments in therapy for me because she said, I thought I would have to die and take this to the grave with me. Um, she also went on to have four children and, and two of those children she gave birth unattended and I think um, these elements of um, being alone, feeling as though no one can help you, feeling as though you can't be reached, were how she spoke in her accounts of those births that has helped me understand my own experience of abuse in life, but also in the care that I try to deliver for women and then in the training as um, Geraldine and I uh, endeavour to deliver. And Cora, your very good point about subconsciously worrying about preventing abuse, but actually abusing their own child. Um, in this time when postnatal care is absolutely threatened up and down the land um, and doesn't exist in some places, that's an, an even more important point. I did look after a lady who in the days will look quite a bit in the, the past. Um, she would have been abused in a pedophile ring, and that was one of the things that she said to me as a community member is that she was terrified that because her mother facilitated her abuse, that she could have something within her that would allow her child to be abused, or that she was capable of, of abusing that child as well. So a lot of um, worry for that lady over that score, and that doesn't end in advice, that, that obviously goes on. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine and Catherine. Uh, we can go on, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, we need to, to end the session now. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation and also an interesting discussion with you afterwards. Thank you.